Okay. Okay. Um, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. I know there was a small problem with the, the link. So I know that quite a few people have been trying to find the right link. So I'm sorry for the small inconvenience. We're trying to solve this. But this session uh, is being recorded and it will be streamed uh, afterwards on, uh, on Unifesp's uh, YouTube. And I will divulge this link afterwards. This means that uh, if in case some, some of you have not been able to have access to the record to the session uh, live, you're going to have access to it once uh, it is uploaded to YouTube. Um, first of all, I have a few thank you notes. And before we start the session itself, um, welcome everyone. Uh, it is a great privilege for the Federal University of Sao Paulo to host international webinars, especially now during these weird times. Um, I would like to thank the Graduate Studies and Research Executive Vice Rectorate for this initiative, which falls within the scope towards the fostering of internationalization of our programs. And I would especially like to thank Dr. Harry Lee Poe for having accepted my personal invitation. I would like to thank um, for the support from our technical staff as well and the presence of such a large and diverse audience. We have over 300 enrollments for this talk today. People from all over Brazil, in fact. Um, first of all, before introducing our keynote speaker, some alerts. Um, the session will only uh, be in English, and it's not going to be possible for us to translate it into Portuguese, unfortunately. Uh, however, during the question and answer session, which is which will take place towards the last uh, half an hour of this uh, webinar, uh, I'll be uh, glad to translate whatever comments or questions you may uh, make in Portuguese. Uh, certificates for those enrolled will be available as of Monday through the same registration link you have used. This session is programmed to take an initial talk from our keynote, followed by this half an hour question and answer session, as I said. So questions should be sent exclusively via chat. The presentation, however, as I said before, will not be translated. Uh, we'll be recording this session. In fact, we are already recording it and we'll be streaming it afterwards on UNIFESP's YouTube. Let me now introduce our keynote speaker, speaker Dr. Harry Lee Poe. Harry Lee Poe serves as Charles Coulson Professor of Faith and Culture at Union University in Jackson, Tennessee, USA. The author of 19 books, his work on Edgar Allan Poe includes two books, Edgar Allan Poe, an illustrated companion to his Telltale Stories in 2008, for which he won an Edgar Award in 2009, and Evermore, Edgar Allan Poe and the Mystery of the Universe in 2012. He has also contributed chapters in Edgar Allan Poe in 20 Objects, 2016, Poe and Place in 2018, Anthologizing Poe in 2020, and a number of articles. He served for 10 years as president of the Edgar Allan Poe Museum in Richmond and is descended from Edgar Allan Poe's cousin, William Poe. That's why his last name is Poe. The Poe Studies Association honored him in 2015 by naming him as honorary member for life. A lover of books like Auguste Dupont and Lord Peter Wimsey, Hall collects first editions, ephemera and memorabilia related to Edgar Allan Poe and the Inklings of Oxford. His Poe collection has been on display in a number of major libraries, including the National Library of Russia in St. Petersburg in 2009. Dr. Poe is married to Marianne, who serves as Dean of the School of Social Work at Union University. They have two daughters, Rebecca, who's married to Joshua Hayes, and Mary Allen, 
Paul, um, thank you once again for having accepted this invitation. It's a great honor for us to listen to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for the honor of being invited uh, to be a part of this webinar. And uh, welcome to all of those who are listening and watching today. Uh, greetings from uh, the Northern Hemisphere, where it's very hot, and uh, we're having uh, hurricanes on the East Coast and wildfires on the West Coast. So uh, we'll be glad when uh, the weather cools a bit. Well, the occasion for this uh, webinar is um, a voyage that Edgar Allan Poe made as a child from uh, Richmond, Virginia, to London, uh, and between 1815 and 1820, young Edgar Poe lived in London and went to school there. So this is the 200th anniversary of the end of that experience in England. And what I would like for us to examine is the influence of that five-year period on Poe's later uh, work and his understanding. So, um, as we begin, I'll uh, remind you of something that affected both North and South America, the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, of course, the, the King of Portugal uh, had to flee to uh, Brazil um, when Napoleon came marching across the peninsula. And um, in North America, we found ourselves in the interesting situation of having fought one war with Britain for our independence. Um, in 1812, during the Napoleonic Wars, we fought a, a second war with Britain, um, creatively named the War of 1812. Um, it was over uh, trade. The, uh, the British uh, were commandeering American ships, coming on board, uh, seizing American sailors and forcing them to um, serve in the British Navy um, and um, uh, trade with France was outlawed by the English. And so we, we had a little war that um, ended in stalemate. But for John Allen, uh, the, the um, uh, foster father of Edgar Allan Poe, it meant a great deal of financial trouble because his primary business was uh, operating a, a trade with Britain. So um, between 1812 and 1815, um, the, um, his business suffered tremendously. So as a re result of that, when the War of 1812 was over in 1814, and um, the uh, wars with Napoleon ended in 1815, uh, Mr. Allen took his uh, small family, his wife and their foster child, Edgar, to London to, for five years to try to reestablish his, his business. Um, he left his partner, Mr. Ellis, in, in Richmond to operate the business. And so for five years, they tarried in London. Um, the, the Napoleonic Wars ended uh, that summer of... Uh, 1815, the Battle of Waterloo was fought and Napoleon defeated, and uh, young Edgar arrived in London shortly after um, that defeat. Now, um, Poe already had an association with England, um, but, but one that he wasn't acquainted with. Um, his mother was English, she was an English actress who had come to the United States as a, as a uh, child actress with her mother. Poe's grandmother, Mrs. Arnold, was married in London at St. George's Church, Hanover Square, a prominent church there in, in old London. And uh, she performed at um, the uh, Royal Theatres of Drury Lane and Covent Garden. And... Um, was on the stage in the 1790s before she finally decided to uh, go to America and seek her fortune there where there wasn't as much competition and where an English actress would do very well. 
So that's how um, Poe's mother arrived in uh, the United States. She died when Poe was only two years old. And so um, he was uh, taken into the family of John and Francis Allen in 1811. And uh, they were a childless couple. Mrs. Uh, Allen doted on young Edgar, and he lived um, a very uh, happy childhood. Um, he wanted for nothing, and he was lavished with, with love, affection, and um, all the good things that could come the way of a uh, prosperous middle-class family, a merchant family. But in 1815, um, uh, young Edgar, who was then six, traveled with his foster parents to England. Uh, they left in, in um, July, arrived in uh, Liverpool, England, um, in July of 1815, after a journey of 34 days. And uh, by the way, the, the um, images that I'm using are... Um, images contemporary to the time of Poe. So this is what Liverpool looked like when Poe arrived in 1815. Uh, from Liverpool, they journeyed northward up through uh, the Lake District to Carlisle and then across Hadrian's Wall up to Irvine, Scotland, where Mr. Allen had family. He was from Scotland. Uh, and had immigrated um, as a young man to, um, to Richmond, where he had an uncle. And so uh, most of his family was still there in Scotland. He had a sister who still lived in Scotland. So they visited the towns of, of Irvine and the nearby town of Kilmarnock. And um, uh, they then traveled across Scotland uh, to Edinburgh. See, that image should come up. And this is what Edinburgh looked like in 1813. Um, it was still a, a small city. They uh, were just uh, constructing what's known as the new, the new town. Uh, and so um, in Edinburgh in 1815, Robert Burns uh, and Sir Walter Scott were the literary toasts of Scotland. Um, Burns had died shortly before, but Burns had lived in Irvine. And so young Poe would have been um, in a community that valued poetry, was proud of, of its native poet, Robert Burns. And uh, then in, in Edinburgh, uh, he was in a town um, that valued the literature of Sir Walter Scott, who was responsible for a great revival of interest in Scotland and also the medieval period that would become um, a major force in Victorian England. But Walter Scott is the one who's really responsible for that. And so, so uh, Poe at a, at a young age was... Um, uh, coming in contact with a, a literary world uh, unlike anything he could have come in contact with in the United States. Um, then from Scotland, they traveled southward uh, through the north of England. And um, along this way, he would have, have uh, passed great manor houses, uh, the great houses of England. He would also have seen um, ruined uh, monasteries from uh, that were ruined, put into ruins by Henry VIII and by Cromwell during the English Civil War, and it is in uh, one of these ruined abbeys that the um, uh, story of Lygia is set in one of the ruined abbeys um, that uh, creates an atmosphere appropriate for the um, uh, one of Poe's very favorite tales, Lygia. Um, southward, they went to London. This is a map of uh, London. Here's the, the old city of London right along the Thames and the whole county of Middlesex. Now, today, all of that uh, 
uh, is, is incorporated into the greater London metropolitan area. But just north of the city, um, just a few miles, is the little village of Stoke Newington. And so this is where Poe would spend um, several years in school. Uh, today, it's in, well inside the boundaries of the city of London. Um, and um, in London, uh, Mr. Allen um, looked for a fashionable residence. And there was a new um, uh, a state uh, uh, neighborhood set up by the Duke of Bedford. His last name was Russell, so he named part of it uh, Russell Square. Here's his statue. And around the square uh, were the, uh, the houses. The Allen family lived at uh, first at number 47 Southampton Row. And then the next year, they moved a few houses down to number 39. And there they lived for five years. It was a fashionable address. Um, literary people, uh, artists, all lived there. And um, this is what the houses would have looked like. They were row houses. And Poe uh, set one of his stories actually um, at the address of um, their London house. Number 39 Southampton Row is the address of Sir Patrick O. Grandison in Poe's short story, Why the Little Frenchman Wears His Arm in a Sling. Um, and so um, the, um, the settings for a number of Poe's stories are going to be in England. In, um, in 1854, an, uh, a London magazine, The Leisure Hour, published a rather vicious attack on Poe, and uh, knowing that he had lived uh, part of his childhood in London, the magazine uh, criticizes him for not setting any of his stories in England. Um, well, they would have done well if they'd read some of his stories. He actually set 10 of his stories in, in, in England, um, which is a huge number for Poe. Um, um, his, the only place that received anywhere near that many was Charleston, South Carolina, which had three of his stories, but, um, he, uh, was drawing on his experience of, of childhood. And, um, when the, um, the English uh, magazines republished this story, why the little Frenchman wears his hand in a sling, they changed the name and uh, changed the name to The Irish Gentleman and the Little Frenchman. Well, the, the um, uh, Irish Gentleman was uh, the, the Duke of Wellington, and the Little Frenchman is Napoleon. Um, but it's a comic story. Um, and Poe, who's known for horror and that sort of thing, actually didn't care for horror stories at all. His favorite kind of story was a comedy. He loved humorous stories, and of his 75 uh, short stories, 25 are um, comic stories. So um, the overwhelming uh, body of his uh, writing was devoted to humor rather than horror. Um, just around the corner from um, their home in Russell Square was the British Museum on Great Russell Street. Um, and this is the old entrance to the British Museum. And the Bu British Museum was just enjoying a great period of prosperity. Um, they had acquired the uh, Elgin Marbles in um, uh, 1816. And um, they had the Rosetta Stone and a number of mummies and all sorts of artifacts from um, from um, the classical world and from the ancient world. Um, and the um, um, 
the the Rosetta Stone may have contributed to Poe's interest in uh, cryptography and puzzles and coded messages, um, the like of which we find in his short story, The Gold Bug. Um, but uh, we also find um, in the British Museum uh, a number of, of um, Egyptian mummies, and he would later write a, a short story, A Few Words with a Mummy. Um, it's possible that this did not influence him, but um, mummies were not as um, uh, common in the United States as they were in uh, the British Museum. So probably this early association um, marked his imagination for things to come. Um, And so uh, here's a um, uh, what an early printing of some words with a mummy would have looked like uh, in one of the early English editions of Poe's works. Um, well, while the family lived in um, uh, Russell Square, they um, they sent young Edgar to school in Chelsea. Um, Chelsea's on the river, uh, just below um, the Houses of Parliament. And there he studied with um, two sisters, uh, the de Burgh sisters. Now the, the, um, the de Burgh sisters lived um, just down the street from Henry Austin. Uh, most people wouldn't know Henry Austin, but they would know his sister, Jane Austen. And so Jane Austen visited her brother Henry frequently uh, when he lived there, um, a few uh, doors down from the de Burgh sisters. It may be only coincidence, but um, um, Jane Austen named one of her most prominent characters in uh, Pride and Prejudice, Lady Catherine de Burgh. Um, that um, may have come from these sis sisters. We don't know. Um, but we do know that when Poe wrote uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, he named one of the characters in that story Pauline de Burgh. So um, here was his uh, early British education. And he was with them from uh, uh, during 18... Um, uh, 16 and um, early 1817. And um, when he was there, he was just across the street from the Chelsea Hospital, which is a retirement home for um, British soldiers. And here's a scene of the British soldiers there, just down the street from the de Burgh sisters, when they received the word of the uh, victory of the Battle of Waterloo. But, but Poe would have seen these soldiers um, up and down the street uh, when he was a little boy. These, um, these um, veterans of, of uh, the Napoleonic Wars. And um, here's the first printing of Murders in the Rue Morgue, in which he names one of his characters for one of his teachers. Um, in 1817, he moved up to um, Stoke Newington, and there he entered the, um, the school of uh, the Reverend John Bransby, uh, the Manor School. And, um, and this was an important um, experience for Poe. Um, Bransby, uh, had an MA in classics from Cambridge University. Uh, so he was a, he was a scholar. Um, he was a clergyman as well as a school teacher, but he knew the classics well. And this early um, introduction to the classics and love of the classics stamped Poe's writing throughout his career uh, the classics appear throughout his poetry and his short stories. In um, 
one of his early poems, Sonnet to Science, we find Diana, the Naiads, the Hamadryads, in um, uh, his short story, I mean, his poem to Helen, we have Helen of Troy, the Nicaean ships, Naiads, Greece, Rome, Psyche, all within a few lines. Um, um, Anacreon, the lyric poet of sixth century um, uh, Greece, makes an appearance in his short in his uh, poem Romance. In Israfel, uh, they are the seven Pleiads, the nymph daughters of Atlas and the companions of Artemis. Um, the three destinies or the fates, along with Irene, goddess of peace, and the river Lethe of Hades, um, are all present in the sleeper. Um, and so on and on and on, Poe's poetry is... Um, sprinkled with um, uh, references to the classics, not just to be um, oh, appearing to be well-educated, but they are uh, uh, a feature of his thinking and they evoke images of and moods that um, a Poe associates with poetry. So all of this began with his... Um, experience of learning uh, Latin uh, from John Bransby. And um, the manor school was right across the street from the old church in Stoke Newington. Uh, they, the boys would have gone to church services here, um, not just Sunday, but daily. Um, and one of the features of Poe's writings is that he has over 500 uh, quotations and references to the Bible in his short stories and poetry. So an enormous familiarity with the scripture uh, and um, that would have come through the um, daily reading of scripture during the, um, uh, the daily services that they attended. And um, though the, um, the school is in this... Um, um, classical or neoclassical, uh, but rather plain building, the old rectory uh, makes an appearance in um, Poe's short story, William Wilson. In William Wilson, um, Poe sets the story uh, in England and um, just a moment, I'm going to read to you a passage from William Wilson in which he describes um, Stoke Newington. My earliest recollections of school life are connected with a large rambling Elizabethan house in a misty looking village of England where were a vast number of gigantic and gnarled trees. Now, here is um, an illustration of uh, these trees that he's talking about. There was a, a park and a, a walk known as Queen Elizabeth's Walk during his day. A vast number of gigantic and gnarled trees and where all the houses were excessively ancient. In the neighborhood, there are uh, several old manor houses. Um, In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit-soothing place, that venerable old town. At this moment, I fancy, I feel the refreshing chilliness of its deeply shadowed avenues, inhale the fragrance of its thousand shrubberies, and thrill anew with undefinable delight at the deep, hollow note of the church bell, breaking each hour with sullen and sudden roar upon the stillness of the dusky atmosphere in which the fretted Gothic steeple lay embedded and asleep. And so you can see how this village um, 
stayed in his memory. You can even hear the echo of his poem, The Bells, coming through as he describes the church bell um, there in Stoke Newington. Um, and he speaks of these uh, venerable houses, but also in the background of the classics, uh, we have um, uh, probably the kind of, of setting that contributed to uh, the fall of the House of Usher. Yes, the, that story is set in England, and yes, it describes uh, an ancient Gothic house. Um, not the sort of thing that would have been in the United States. Gothic architecture didn't come into the United States until uh, well after Poe's adulthood. Um, any old house in the United States would have been um, uh, uh, from the um, post-Tudor period, the post-Stuart uh, period, uh, and tended to be uh, classical in architecture. But there's another association with this story, and rather than just the architecture and the physical setting, the plot line, the fall of the House of Usher, echoes uh, one of the most famous of all the classical stories, and certainly would have been at the heart of what Dr. Bransby was teaching um, his boys, and that is the story of the fall of the House of Atreus. Um, Atreus, this, this grand story that goes through um, uh, classical Greek literature from uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey um, down to the, to the plays that were later written. Um, you'll remember that Atreus uh, was the founder of the house of which Agamemnon was a member. And uh, it was a family that had a very bad habit of... Um, murdering their children and killing one another. And it was just a ghastly family. And this is the kind of family that um, Poe is describing in the fall of the House of Usher. Um, I mentioned William Wilson. This is the first printing of that tale uh, set in, um, in England, uh, in Stoke Newington, in Oxford. Um, Poe mentioned the shrubberies and the trees in his description of Stoke Newington. They, the British love their gardens. But Dr. Bransby, um, in addition to being a classicist, was also interested in botany and particularly in, in gardening, um, the grand gardening that the English do. And so years later, when Poe had uh, become an editor, an editor of um, and um, was writing short stories. Um, one of these is um, the story of the Landscape Garden. Um, and that tale, um, he expanded later into the domain of Arnheim, in which he describes landscape gardening as um, one of the highest of all the art forms. Um, and this would have been something that he developed a love for while he was in England, just as a boy. Another of uh, Dr. Bransby's great interests uh, was science and astronomy. And um, this interest caught on very early for Poe. And so while he was living in London, his foster father, Mr. Allen, bought him a very expensive uh, telescope for viewing the stars. And that telescope um, is today at the Poe House in Baltimore. It's been preserved. It was saved. It was kept in the family. And um, it uh, is a token of the love Poe developed for science. When he was the editor of Burton's Magazine, he wrote a column, a monthly column, uh, a chapter on science and art, and he would explore uh, the latest thing in science, new discoveries, uh, new inventions, new insights. He developed one more interest while he was with Dr. Bransby, and that was uh, field sports. 
uh, Bransby was a great lover of uh, the um, manly pastimes uh, in England. And Poe became quite an athlete. Um, he was especially good at track and field and at swimming. And he was famous when he returned to, to Richmond for swimming um, against the tide uh, six miles on the James River. It was a it was a fabulous feat, and he was famous among all the the boys in Richmond for having accomplished it. But um, uh, he uh, published this monthly column in Burton's magazine on field sports, and in which he examines and explains uh, the different sports that were particularly um, um, famous in, in Britain. Well, the, the atmosphere of London is certainly set by the Tower of London, which anchors the, the, uh, the lower edge of London on the river, um, dating back to Roman times, part of the um, uh, ruins of, of Roman Britain are within the precincts of the Tower of London, uh, built by William the Conqueror uh, beginning in 1066. It essentially chronicles the history of England since then. Um, it's the sort of place Poe would have known about, would have visited. Mrs. Allen made sure Poe had every advantage she would have made sure he saw everything that could be seen uh, to educate him. And um, this is what the Tower of London looked like there on the waterfront of the Thames when Poe was there um, between 1815 and 1820. Now, one of the remarkable things about the Tower of London is its association with ravens. There's a... Um, a group of ravens that have been in residence there for centuries and they clip the wings so the ravens cannot fly away because the legend is that if the ravens ever leave the Tower of London, the British monarchy will fall. And so the raven still is sitting, still is sitting, and its shadow shall be lifted nevermore. This is possibly one of the influences on Poe of um, his use of the raven. Uh, the other is uh, this little fellow, uh, Grip, um, the raven in um, Charles Dickens' novel, uh, Barnaby Rudge. And Poe um, uh, predicted the um, uh, uh, murderer in uh, Barnaby Rudge before it was printed in uh, its monthly installment. So he began his sleuthing career in um, solving the crime, uh, but in that story, there is a pet raven who can speak. And so um, both of these influences uh, from England are thought to have influenced uh, Poe's writing of the raven, if not directly, at least subliminally. And uh, there in London, uh, they're famous for their cabs. Uh, the old um, horse-drawn taxi cab um, that people um, navigated from one end of, of London to the other. And Poe wrote a, 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 an essay on the difference between cabs in New York and cabs in London. And it's the sort of essay that grows out of his own familiarity of being carted around London by um, Mrs. Allen and all the things he saw, all the throngs, all the crowds. Um, and um, this would have given him a context for writing his short story, The Man of the Crowd. And in it, he explores um, London and perhaps the underside of London. Uh, Mr. Allen's um, business, his offices, were located near the Guild Hall, which is near uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. And between St. Paul's Cathedral and uh, the River Thames is um, a business district, uh, would have been a business district in the, in the 19th century. 
warehouses along the river itself. It was before the uh, Victorian embankment and uh, before the uh, different rivers and streams that flowed into the uh, uh, River Thames had been covered and um, enclosed in culverts. It was all open and it was all open sewage. And it was the sort of um, London that is described by Charles Dickens and Oliver Twist. Um, but this was the, um, uh, the kind of hustling, bustling place that um, Edgar Allan Poe was seeing between the ages of six and 11. In this same district, he set one of his short stories, King Pest, a story about the, um, uh, the, the plague that took place during the reign of Edward III, uh, King of England between 1327 and 1377. And it's a, a grotesque uh, comic tale that might be appropriate today with our coronavirus. Uh, then further down the river is um, Greenwich Hospital, um, which had been uh, the Naval College. It is now uh, Greenwich University, but uh, very famous for these double domes uh, set right on the river. And just up the hill behind it is the Greenwich Observatory. Now, um, uh, Poe set... Um, one of his stories, Peter Snook, uh, a businessman of London, um, he rambles all around a number of important locations in London, but one of the places he goes is, is Greenwich. Um, but because of the observatory, um, this was where the famous clock was located um, that determined longitude. And so the British declared that this is the point at which um, the planet Earth is divided. And this is the zero meridian, the prime meridian. And um, on the basis of um, clocks being um, set um, for naval voyages from this spot. And so... Um, it's an interesting um, scientific idea, but Poe set um, one of his funniest and one of my favorite stories. It's a romantic comedy, a succession of Sundays or three Sundays in a week. Uh, he set this tale in London and it depends upon um, one captain sailing his ship east, another sailing his ship west, both of them circumnavigating the globe and arriving back in London on the same day a year later. And um, in that case, one captain is uh, in Saturday, another captain is in uh, Monday, and the people in London are in Sunday. And uh, Poe thought that quite fascinating but it drew him uh, to the conclusion that there is no privileged time or space within the universe. And this is a major feature of Einstein's theory of relativity, but uh, Poe suggested it um, uh, 60 years before Einstein. Uh, Poe also, this is the beginning of his interest in science fiction. So um, Three Sundays in a Week is also science fiction because of its um, examination of time. Jules Verne would take that story and develop it into Around the World in 80 Days. Now, um, Poe wrote another story um, uh, that begins in Britain. Some men build a, a hot air balloon that um, is shaped like a cigar and has a gondola underneath with a light engine that powers a propeller with a rudder so that they can navigate the, uh, the balloon and they cross the Atlantic Ocean. This tale is known as the balloon hoax 
Um, when Jules Verne read the balloon hoax, he decided he wanted to write that kind of story. And so his very first science fiction tale was Five Weeks in a Balloon. And um, uh, Verne acknowledged uh, Poe as the source of his inspiration for, uh, for many of his stories. Um, but again, this um, interest in science and beginning in Britain. Um, it culminated, this interest in science culminated in 1848 with the publication of Eureka. And um, uh, in Eureka, Poe depends upon a number of observations as astronomical observations um, made um, in Britain, in this case in, in, in Ireland. But in this, in this uh, essay, Poe proposes um, the primary features of what we now know as the Big Bang Theory, Relativity Theory, Chaos Theory, um, uh, the principle of um, the continuity of light and electromagnetism, and the idea that um, at the center of the atom, and Madame Curie had not yet done her work at this point, Poe predicted that um, we would discover uh, a principle of attraction and repulsion. And this is the essential um, feature of uh, both the strong and weak nuclear forces. So he was quite ahead of his time in foreseeing um, what would have to be put together, all the different ideas that would be necessary for um, uh, a Big Bang universe. Here's the title page. Um, and then that brings us to um, uh, the trip back to, um, to the United States in 1820, 200 years ago this year. Um, so here's a small boy traveling for more than a month across the North Atlantic in a sailing ship, I can't imagine. I have been on a sailing ship, a tall ship. We cruised the uh, Irish Sea. Uh, there were 90 passengers on board, and it was a much larger ship than the one Poe would have been on. And lo and behold, we met the remains of uh, Hurricane Char Charlie in, um, in the Irish Sea, where apparently hurricanes go to retire. We had 17-foot waves, um, it was enough to send me to bed, but I can't imagine what um, uh, adversity people would have experienced in, in crossing the ocean in small vessels. In any event, Poe would have known what it was like to sail. Uh, he would have known what a ship was like, what the customs were like aboard ship, and he incorporates all of that in um, Manuscript found in a bottle, also known as MS found in a bottle. And then his only complete novel, a narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, uh, which uh, again is a, is a, a sea tale um, with uh, richly um, um, illustrated or, or, or described uh, in terms he would have understood from his own experience of sailing. And finally, um, he wrote a tale of sailing. Uh, the Oblong Box is a, a voyage from Charleston to New York. Um, so in uh, early childhood, he had these um, rich, rich experiences that... Um, would percolate in his brain and ferment and finally come out in the form of short stories, essays, and, and poetry. Now, um, in the time we've got left, I'd like to just briefly talk about Poe's reception in Britain. Um, his stories were being pirated as early as 1840. Uh, Bentley's magazine reproduced uh, The Duke de L'Omelette, The Fall of the House of Usher, and the Irish gentleman and the little Frenchman, um, all in 1840. Um, there were no copyright 
uh, laws at that time. And when uh, Charles Dickens visited the United States in 1842, one of the primary discussions that Poe and Dickens had was the necessity of international copyright laws. Um, his book, uh, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, was pirated in 1838. A London edition was produced. His book, um, uh, The Raven and Other Poems, was pirated in 1846. His collection of short stories, Tales of 1845, was, was uh, pirated in two editions in 1845 and 1846. So there was a market for Poe in Britain. Then uh, in pamphlet form, uh, his tale, The Facts of uh, M. Valdemar's Case. This, you may remember, is a tale of a man who was hypnotized just before death and um, uh, was uh, kept in contact by hypnotism after he died. So a startling tale. Uh, it was issued in pamphlet form in 1846. Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote to Poe um, about this time, Poe had dedicated uh, The Raven, his volume of poetry, to her. And in thanking him, she said that um, his tale of, of mesmerism uh, had taken London by storm and everybody assumed it was a true story. And this was the, uh, the nature of Poe's experimentation with science fiction. These tales were often referred to as hoaxes, um, but Poe was simply trying to give them an air of uh, verisimilitude, of realism. And so um, uh, they were working quite well. Uh, then um, after Poe died, um, a collection of his, his um, uh, poetry was issued by um, Visatelli in 1852. And this volume is illustrated. So this is the first illustrated volume of Poe's works. It was done in England. At the same time in 1850, uh, Rufus Griswold had issued a two volume collection of the works of, of Poe. He would issue a third volume in 1853 and a fourth volume in 1856. But the English were, were moving along with it and, and issued this one uh, illustrated in 1852. The same year, a cheap edition uh, was issued by uh, Rutledge Press. And um, uh, uh, John Ingram, who became Poe's greatest defender in the 19th century, issued um, a four volume collection <coughs> of Poe's works in 1874 and 1875. He then issued um, a collection of Poe's letters. So this is the first collection of Poe's letters. There would be a number of collections issued after that as more letters were discovered. Harrison issued one in the early 20th century. And then uh, there was another um, uh, collection issued in the 1940s. It was updated uh, in the 1970s. And then a fifth separate collection of uh, the letters of Poe uh, were issued uh, around the time of his bicentennial, around uh, 20, uh, two, 2009, all because people keep discovering more letters from Poe. And then cheap editions were being issued by the the London Press. This is a cheap back edition from the 1890s. <clears throat> and the greatest tribute to Poe came when Arthur Conan Doyle modeled his detective Sherlock Holmes on uh, Poe's literary creation, literary detective um, Auguste Dupin. And um, I have a... Um, Find it. A, um, well, a tribute that um, 
that Conan Doyle paid to Poe, and it's become a tradition among uh, detective fiction writers at some point in one of their stories to um, acknowledge Poe. So in his first detective story, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle um, had his character, um, Sherlock Holmes, in a discussion with Dr. Watson. It is simple enough as you explain it, I said, smiling. You remind me of Edgar Allan Poe's Dupin. I had no idea that such individuals did exist outside of stories. Sherlock Holmes rose and lit his pipe. No doubt you think that you are complimenting me and comparing me to Dupin, he observed. Now, in my opinion, Dupin was a very inferior fellow that trick of his of breaking in on his friend's thoughts with an apropos remark after a quarter of an hour's silence is really very showy and superficial. He had some analytical genius, no doubt, but he was by no means such a phenomenon as Poe appeared to imagine. Well, this is a tongue-in-cheek acknowledgement of Poe, and Doyle went on to imitate Dupin and his sidekick, um, in the telling of the uh, Sherlock Holmes stories. And um, uh, years later, uh, Dorothy L. Sayers, the great English mystery writer, uh, published an anthology of the great uh, mystery stories of the uh, previous um, decades. And in it, she writes an introduction that is essentially an explanation of how Poe's five mystery plots um, are the only mystery pl plots that have ever been developed, and that all the mystery stories are simply retelling, resetting, um, re-detailing uh, uh, the five mystery stories that Poe created. And so the English have had a, a continuing love affair with Edgar Allan Poe's uh, mystery stories um, down through the years. And uh, with that, I will conclude my presentation and uh, turn it back over to our moderator to moderate a, uh, a discussion time. If you have questions, you can submit them by chat. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Renata. We'll just wait a moment while the technology Works. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, Hal, I would love to thank you again. It's not I would like to, I would love to thank you uh, for this excellent presentation. Um, it's absolutely uh, fundamental for research on Poe in Brazil. Um, many of the, the elements, many of the details regarding Poe's stay in Britain, um, I can affirm uh, are absolutely unknown in Brazil. So it's it's an excellent contribution to us. Um, I cannot stop thanking you for this and um, and for your kindness in fitting in within a very hectic period of time of fitting in this webinar. I know you're teaching and I know you, you taught in the morning and you're going to teach again now in the afternoon. So uh, your kindness uh, is absolutely appreciated. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me. No, it's really an honor. Uh, absolutely, it's an honor. Um, I, w we've known each other for so many, you know, so many years now. I remember the first time I saw you back in 2002 uh, at the Poe Conference um, in Philadelphia. And uh, I was impressed. So I, I kept this image you know, in the back of my mind. I said, okay, one day I'm going to find a way of bringing you to Brazil. And I said, okay, I'm doing this now, even though it's a little bit weird. It's not exactly the way I wanted it to be, but that's the best way I, I found. Um, I mean, it would have been, of course, a privilege to, to bring you, uh, you know, physically speaking, right? To have you here uh, in presence, but that's the best we can do. Well, um, when, King passed, when King passed goes away, um, uh, I'll find my way to Sao Paulo. <laughs> you're going to be more than welcome. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I'm going to open up um, for discussion now. We're going to have this uh, question and answer session. So if anybody would like to make questions, uh, you can simply use the chat um, portion of the website. Uh, for now, we have compliments and, and more compliments. So we're going to open up. Uh, but while we're waiting for people um, to come up with their own questions, I would like to make two specific questions, if you don't mind. Uh, so this way we can open up the debate. Yeah. Uh, the first question that I would make has to do with Mary Shelley. Um, I'm particularly interested in Mary Shelley's possible resonance in Poe's works. Yeah. Uh, I know that there's not much on it um, as far as research goes on. So this is my current research project. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on this. Um, I know that you've been working on science, Poe and science for such a long time. What do you think? Yes, uh, I, um, <clears throat> Mary Shelley wrote the first modern science fiction story. The real, mm -hmm. the, the Frankenstein is really the first true science fiction story. Um, mm -hmm. At the time, they thought of it as, as gothic horror. Well, it's got that element, um, but it's got this, it's built around science and what science might become and what are the possibilities of science. And so it really is the prototype of, I think, of all science fiction. And um, we don't know, but we suspect that Poe um, read Frankenstein. In fact, I think I think Richard Copley um, said that he'd found a, a, a an instance of Poe reading it. I can't I can't remember. I'm, I won't I won't put those words in his mouth. But I, I I think I've 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 heard that. I haven't found it myself yet. Um, but uh, she was the one who did it. I can't imagine that Poe was not aware of Frankenstein. I just can't imagine that. Um, because he, he does write a number of science fiction stories. And um, uh, the Valdemar story, the ones like that, are, are really along the lines of the Frankenstein story. Um, that is, it has to do with bi biology rather than um, technicalities, technology. Um, so I think there's a link there, and I hope you'll pursue it, um, but, but because I think the affinity is, is huge, and Poe's understanding that it wasn't gothic horror. Uh, yes, it, 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 he, he, at one point he said that the, 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 the horror isn't really r related to German gothic, it's related to the very nature of the, of the human mind. Right. And um, so it's not an imitation of that, uh, what was going on in, in Germany. But but she was she was breaking new ground, and um, and Poe followed enthusiastically behind her. And the book was published while he was there. So yes, yes, another interesting biographical element, right? There yes. is a letter, there is a letter um, which in fact can be found on the Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, Society of Baltimore's webpage, and I found it there. It was kind of hidden uh, in, between, in between so many other um, uh, research projects and articles um, that can be found there. Uh, and, and in this particular letter, in fact, it is a reproduction of a letter that had been published towards the end of the 19th century. And uh, this letter was written by somebody whose name I, I can't remember right now, but whose grandmother uh, was a big art um, uh, lover, let's say. So she had those uh, sessions when, when she would welcome painters and artists in, in general and writers to her house for piano sessions and for, you know, uh, book discussions. And this guy um, remembers when he was a child uh, and he remembers seeing Paul uh, in his grandma's house. And uh, he remembers even the the armchair uh, where uh, Paul would sit for hours on end. And this armchair would be located inside his grandma's library. And uh, his grandma used to say that Paul loved reading three specific books from her library, which was huge. And one of them was Frankenstein. 
Ah. So there, it, this is a document that can be found, as I said, on the Baltimore webpage. And this is where I started my research from. So I said, well, ah. it's not every day where they would find uh, traces like those. We normally yes. do exactly this. We assume, we imagine that maybe the author might have had access to a certain book. But at, this is a recollection. Um, now, if you can trust it, I don't know. If it's not another hoax, <laughs> um, yeah. on a poll, we cannot say, we cannot tell. But anyway, this was something that um, is in the back of my mind, has been in the back of my mind for some time now. So this is precisely what I'm trying to research on. Maybe um, write the article. <laughs> um, maybe. <laughs> that would be, let's say, one of the products of this research um, that I started last year and that will continue for some time, for sure. Um, we have a couple of questions that have just come up. Let's see if, you know, how many we can take, how many would like to take. One of them is the following. I'm going to read it from, from the chat. Um, Professor, how would you describe Paul's Americanish view of European themes and geography in his short stories? All right. Now, um, one of the things Poe was concerned with was the creation of a truly American literature. And um, American uh, um, people in the United States to this day uh, continue to be intimidated culturally by the English. Mm -hmm. They just really still are. Um, and so he was concerned with a truly uh, American literature, but um, he did not want that to be provincialism. And so uh, you had both things going on in the early 19th century. You did have uh, American writing that was very provincial. Um, and then you had American writing that was very imitative of uh, the European. Mm -hmm. um, and so as far as we know, Poe never visited uh, the European continent. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, tales that he went to Paris and that he was involved in the Greek Revolution and that he was in St. Petersburg. But those, the, those are pretty much discredited that, that England was as far as he got. Um, and so you find um, not so much that he is imitating English literature as he is um, using the, um, well, the landscape as the, uh, and um, the, uh, the environment and, um, and the history and that sort of thing. We do know he set a number of stories in uh, Europe, um, Cask of Amontillado, Mask of the Red Death, Metzingerstein, um, Duke Lamlet, um, uh, Hans Fall, um, The Pit and the Pendulum. So he, he set stories all over Europe without ever ha actually having been there. So it's, um, we don't find him describing landscapes very often. And so he would what he would tend to do is um, he would use a place uh, that might evoke in the reader's mind all sorts of images. Mm -hmm. And without describing them, he evokes them, uh, which is a clever trick. Uh, my favorite one is the, uh, the opening sentence in uh, The Fall of the House of Usher. And he doesn't actually describe the landscape. He describes his feeling about mm -hmm. the landscape. Mm -hmm. And that leaves the reader to imagine it the way they want to. And he, he, he does that an awful lot. But, but I think that's one thing that's going on with, with European settings. Um, uh, and I, I don't know if that quite gets at what the, uh, the, the question intended, but I, I hope that helps. No, absolutely, absolutely. And one thing that I was thinking about, even in Marginalia, Paul talks about the idea of suggesting uh, rather than stating whatever um, should be said. And his readings of Coleridge might have also uh, somehow helped him out uh, with this whole image that he wanted to portray, right? 
and uh, you've just mentioned you know, what the fact that we we have those tales that talk about the fact that Paul might have actually gone to Greece and so on and so forth, but perhaps they can see be seen as hoaxes, just like the so many hoaxes that Paul actually uh, wrote. Right? You've mentioned uh, a couple of them in your presentation today, but there are more. Right? There are those stories that he, he invented of the Martians invading New York, etc. right? So he was very humorous. And the, the, the business about the suggestion, uh, I think it's possible that he got some of it from the very idea of Greek tragedy, where um, uh, so much of the action takes place off stage. It's suggested, but you don't see it. And... Um, one of the remarkable things about Poe's stories about um, oh murder and blood and gore is that there is no murder and blood and gore in the stories. It's suggested, but he doesn't describe it, and it doesn't happen. I mean, in the in the cask of Amontillado, nobody dies in the story, but mm -hmm. you know that they die. Mm -hmm. And in the pit and the pendulum, nobody dies. But you're afraid they're going to die. And in descent into the maelstrom, nobody dies. But you're scared to death he's going to die. He's about to die, but he doesn't die. And so um, uh, this is um, one of his, his, his talents. He's, he uses the imagination of the reader to provide these awful, horrible things that aren't from Poe at all. They're all in the mind of the reader. So when people talk about how how gory and ghastly Poe is, they're really talking about their own imagination. Right. No, absolutely. And and uh, even some of the, the the titles he gives to the publications that he managed them how to work on have to do with the word imagination. So tales of imagination. So he himself gave titles, um, including the word imagination. So pointing at what he was actually talking about, perhaps, right? Um, well, please go I, ahead. I, I've just, while we're on imagination, um, most people have not read Eureka, but the introduction to Eureka deals with the imagination as the primary organ, uh, Poe believed, for the discovery of new knowledge, that all scientific discovery is based not on calculation, but on imagination. Uh, calculation comes in later on, but first you have to have the idea. And the mm -hmm. idea that is explored by science is produced by imagination rather than calculation. Absolutely, you've got a good point. Yeah, and in fact, in Brazil, Eureka tends to have a very uh, poor, if we can use this word, a poor reception. Not many people study and read Eureka, even though there have been a couple of uh, translations on the way at this point. I know that there is a translation, a new translation, that perhaps will come out next year. But this is this is a work that needs further reading in Brazil. Um, I have a question here from a very good friend of mine. In fact, uh, we, we uh, are together in a research group. Uh, Alexander Medielis da Silva. Hi, Lex. Um, he's asking uh, the following. Um, I would like to ask Professor Harry Paul about Edgar Allan Poe as a weird writer. How does he see it? China Mivio, for example, regards Poe as a precursor of weird in the first half of the 19th century. Um, well, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think... One of the things Poe um, was afraid of was that he might get typecast as one kind of a writer and only writing this kind of story, whereas his ambition was to demonstrate novelty and innovation and variety um, without being repetitious. And so um, I think in the breadth of Poe's stories, some are weird. Some are humorous. Some are, are romantic comedies. Um, and so, uh, yes, you do have um, you do have those that are just strange. Uh, there was even a volume of post stories published about 1895. I, I, it had a, a title something like Weird Tales. I think that was the title. 
um, of the collection. Uh -huh. And um, and with Poe, it's a matter of um, rather than typecasting him and using one word to categorize all of his work, it's more a matter of recognizing how many different types of of tale he could tell. That was his ambition. And it's why uh, Dorothy Sayers speculates that he only wrote five mystery stories because he could only conceive of five plots and he wasn't going to repeat himself. Now, Agatha Christie used the same plot over and over and over again. Um, that is, um, her detective knew who did it, but he didn't have the evidence to prove it. So he had to trick him into confessing. And that goes on over and over and over and over again. Um, and that's the plot from Thou Art the Man. Um, so um, his struggle to find a new way of, of saying something or something new to say, weird would definitely be one of those, those kinds of stories. And perhaps uh, something that just cro has just crossed my mind, perhaps this has to do with the idea, the, the romantic idea of totali uh, totalitarianity. So the idea of no, somehow reaching a certain totality that has long been lost. So when you have a, a, a whole collection of works that handle different aspects of something, but somehow correspond and dialogue with the other works that you have also produced, this certain sense of totality can be reached. Yes, yes. And, and what you've just now said, I think, really captures what Poe was aiming at, uh -huh. this idea of a, of a whole, because every person has different, different emotions, different aspects to their character and personality, and it takes all of them to make a person. And Poe was, I think, trying to aim at that totality that you're talking about, mm -hmm. that unity, that, that uh -huh. oneness. Yeah, this was the word I was trying to remember, unity, I mean. Um, there's another question here that um, perhaps you could uh, answer if there's still time. Um, the person says the following. I read a letter um, by Paul from her mother, from, uh, from his mother in 1848, uh, where he says that he can leave because Eureka was written. His interest, uh, his interest in astronomy and philosophy, do you think that that made him somehow um, create this aesthetic effects that we tend to find in his tales and poems? So the person's thinking about Eureka. Do you think that Eureka somehow is his definite work? In this well, work? he thought it was. He uh -huh. considered it his magnum opus. And as you go through Eureka, you'll find that he is quoting himself. Um, so you'll find uh, things that he had written in 1840, 1842, 1844, that find their way into Eureka. And um, uh, his examination of how imagination works, um, it's a discussion that takes place in Murders in the Rue Morgue and the Mystery of Marie Roget and the Purloined Letter. Um, and um, his idea of the universe, it pops up in a number of essays, and it's the, these Eureka is something that he was thinking about for at least 10 years before he wrote it. Mm -hmm. And he was, and it, it, it pops up in marginalia, just little lines. And as you, as you read Eureka, if you're familiar with all the, all the other things that he'd written, you say, oh my goodness. He's talking about something that he talked about in um, uh, th this earlier story. And um, so, yes, I think he did see it as the culmination of, of some important questions he was asking. First question that many of us ask, if there's a good, all-powerful, loving God, then why did my mother die when I was two years old? He was dealing with the problem of suffering as it's known. Most people end with that one. So if my mother died when I was two years old. There's just no God, or at least there's no loving God. But Poe was asking other questions too. He was asking, well, if there's just a brute universe, if there's just matter, how do you explain love? How do you explain beauty? Because in a brute universe, there's nothing good or bad, nothing ugly or beautiful. There's just what is. 
So how do you explain this sort of thing? In a brute universe, how do you explain a sense of right and wrong or justice? And his, his mystery stories explore this because the mystery story only works if the audience brings to the story a sense of right and wrong, a sense of justice, uh, a desire to know who did it, a desire that the innocent person be set free, a desire for the um, uh, evil perpetrator to be punished. Uh, the audience must care about justice. It's a strange thing. It's another example of how he he wants he 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 draws the audience into his story so that they must contribute to the story itself. And in in the mystery stories, the audience has to contribute the idea of justice, or the story doesn't work. Um, so he was asking all of these questions. And the final big question is, why is there something rather than nothing? And so those are the questions that he explores and finally comes to the conclusion um, that the universe has not existed forever, as Aristotle taught. It had a beginning. Uh, it is not infinite in size, as Aristotle and Newton taught. It is finite. It's very big, but it's finite. Um, it had a beginning and it will have an end. And his conclusion, therefore, there is a God. But um, he weaves into it something he would talk about in, uh, um, in an uh, essay in um, uh, the De Democratic Review on the American drama. And he was talking about what's wrong with American plays. They're terrible. They're just awful. And uh, he explored what makes a plot work. And then he said, the universe is the perfect plot. The universe is a plot of God. And so his conclusion was that God is responsible for the universe, uh, that it, it may have evolved. And he has the idea of evolution in Eureka as well as, as relativity. Uh, but he says the universe is like a story. It's like a story. And um, you don't get resolution until the end of the story. And so his conclusion is that um, the resolution of the love of God, the justice of God, uh, the beauty, uh, and all of that um, is found in uh, the resolution of the universe at the end. So it's, it's fascinating, you know, what he was doing. Um, uh, but it's something that, that people struggled with at the time. They said Poe was insane because he disagreed with what everybody knows, um, Aristotle's understanding of the universe. And that didn't change until the last quarter of the 20th century. The Big Bang Theory did not become accepted until after 1975. And so he was so far ahead of his time that everything he said sounded crazy, just absolutely crazy. Now you read it and everything he writes seems, oh, well, yeah, we know that. Everybody knows the butterfly effect. Everybody knows chaos theory. Everybody knows relativity. So there's nothing new there except that he came up with it 100 years before science did. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And perhaps the same could be said because there's a question here regarding Poe and psychoanalysis. Perhaps the same could be said about it. Um, Freud never actually mentions uh, Poe in his essays and in his studies of the, of the mind. And um, uh, however, you know, we can see that somehow Poe anticipates many of the, the findings that not only Freud, but Jung and, and the other um, precursors of psychoanalysis uh, would talk about almost 100 years afterwards, right? Yes, he was, he was taking the mind seriously. Um, in a way that it really never been done before. And, and um, psychology wasn't even in its infancy yet. Um, it, it would not be in its infancy, excuse me, until the end of the 19th century with um, people like um, uh, William James um, before Freud. Um, and it, it, during Poe's time, phrenology was the science of of the mind and it was the bumps on your skull and it was it was it was looked more like alchemy than science it really wasn't science well it was an attempt at science but without a scientific basis and poe thought that was all 
al Hui, but it did know that the mind was a complicated thing. It was a very complicated thing. And um, uh, so, yes, his, his idea of the unreliable narrator. <laughs> what, what do you do if the person telling this story can't be relied upon? Well, you come up with a very weird story, don't you? But it's something that rings true to experience. Um, so, yeah, he, he anticipated a great deal. And uh, there is a question here that goes pretty well with the idea of insanity. Um, this person asks the following. Think of our current context. Um, how did Poe use or deal with the pandemic in his texts? Well, the first thing that calls my mind, crosses my mind, is definitely uh, uh, Red Death. But not only that, uh, King passed. But what do you think? Yeah, yes, and it was it was something he, uh, they were dealing with. I mean, my my great great grandfather, Poe's cousin, died in the um, yellow fever epidemic of eighteen fifty six, and oh, wow. um, and so that's what people were familiar with. It was. Um, uh, yellow fever, malaria, and it was a seasonal thing. You know, we worry about it uh, once in a blue moon, but there it was an annual event. And some years it was worse than other years. Um, and uh, it was a, a common problem um, in the United States, um, all up and down the Eastern seaboard. Well, uh, once you got up to New York, you didn't have to worry about it quite as much as you did in the southern southern states with, mm -hmm. with mosquitoes and all of that. But um, nonetheless, it was something he was certainly familiar with. And um, and there was no protection, absolutely no protection against it. It was a silent killer. And um, your money wouldn't protect you. And um, you either accepted the solidarity of the human race um, and did something about it as as a human, or you acted like Prince Prospero, and even the name Prosperity, wealth, um, and you can shun the rest of the the, the race. But if you do that, um, uh, be sure the Red Death will find you. <laughs> so, yeah, I, it is a tale that that speaks to um, twenty twenty, isn't it? Definitely. Um, yeah. And you cannot beat it. No matter what you do, you cannot beat it. You can try. I mean, uh, you in King Quest, there is, a, let's say, a certain sense of happy ending for the drunkards. But yeah. you, don't find that, you don't find that in uh, in Red Death. Definitely you don't. So, well, I hope we have a better um, solution <laughs> for our current situation yeah. than yeah. what they did. Well, I um, hope we won't act like Prince Prospero. <laughs> Hopefully not, even though some countries are beginning to with, with the idea of the vaccine, right? And buying all the uh, all the production from a certain laboratory or making sure that you sign a contract and you don't let anybody else in. Yeah. Well, yeah. scary times. Um, I think we have, if you don't mind, just enough time for a very last question. Yeah, one last question. Okay. Okay. Um, this person asks the following, in your opinion, what is the importance uh, and the influence that you may see in uh, in terms of Charles Brockton Brown's works in uh, Paul's writings? Do you see any dialogue between Brown and Paul? Um, you know, I don't know that I'm qualified to express an opinion on that. I, uh -huh. I'm, I'm afraid I... I'm not knowledgeable enough to really give a uh, an informed opinion. It would just be <laughs> hit or miss, I'm afraid. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll I'll bow out of that question. No, my, no problem. Because I would say the same. Um, even though well, Brown is considered to be the first of the Gothic writers, let's say in the in the U.S. or one of the very first ones, and the Gothic is something that really interested Paul in most of his tales, even the comic ones deal with the com with the Gothic. But I think I would pass that one as well. Um, well, I think we can, we have just enough time to close the session. Uh, Professor Harry Paul, once again, I would 
like to thank you and it was an honor to listen to you. Uh, most comments here are actually greetings and people are absolutely uh, enthusiastic and uh, extremely happy at the opportunity that you have given us. Um, and you know, this, the talk will certainly be in the back of people's minds for a long time. As I said in the beginning of our transmission, um, it's been recorded and it should be up on uh, YouTube next week. And as soon as it's up, uh, we're going to divulge it. This way people can watch it once again and, and, and then and again and again and again, which is something that I myself will do. So I would love to have more time to listen to you, but I know you've got to go and we've also got to go. But thank you so much for having accepted our invitation. It was an honor. It was a privilege and it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been my honor to be with you and be a part of it. Thank you so much for the invitation. Look forward to seeing you soon. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. The yeah. The poll conference, if we have it, yeah. definitely, right? Um, and I would also like to thank everybody for having joined the session. We've had many people um, in. Some people have not been able to have access due to a, a technical problem we had at the beginning of the transmission with the link. But I would like to, to thank everybody who has joined and everybody who has enrolled. And once again, I would like to thank um, for all the support given by uh, UNIFESP, which is the acronym for our institute, for our, our institution, the Federal University of Sao Paulo. Thank you all and uh, see you all next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.